Hi, hello, and welcome to another Expert Insight interview. My name is John Golden from Sales Pop Online Sales Magazine and Pipeliner CRM. And today I am joined by Sarah Canaday, who is in lovely Austin, Texas. How are you doing today, Sarah? I'm doing great. Thank you. Glad to be here. Yeah, and I'm in a, again, I know I've been harping on about this a lot recently, but I'm in a rainy San Diego, which is not what I signed up for. And I, and I have been tempted to send in looking for a rebate from the state government because <laughs> we, pay, we pay high enough taxes, we're supposed to get sunshine all the yes, time. Yes, you do. And it's not happening. Um, okay, so um, Sarah is a keynote speaker, author, and executive coach, and she is also the author of the book, uh, Leadership Unchained, defy conventional wisdom for breakthrough performance. So Sarah, maybe you want to give me a little bit of a background on the genesis of this book and, and why you've titled it um, Defying Conventional Wisdom. Certainly. So, you know, I spent a good 15 years in the corporate world myself mm -hmm. um, and did the classic, you know, traditional route of working my way up from you know, the ground floor, I was in a, a company that had a massive sales uh, department. We uh, had a call center where calls came in, uh, then moved out to the field, then became a manager, you know, worked my way through. And especially in the leadership realm, I was very conscious of the practices of leadership. I read about leadership. I've I watched others and observed and really, you know, was very conscious about following certain practices that frankly worked for me at the time. Mm -hmm. And then when I left corporate and began to do the individual coaching and the leadership workshops and I heard from leaders and I saw leaders, it was clear to me that the map, the territory of business had changed so significantly that we needed a new brand of leadership. And in fact, what I originally kept reflecting on is, wow, I did some things by the book and I wish I hadn't because mm -hmm. I think they limited my impact. And the more I started to research the by the book principles and whether or not they were working today, the more I understood that Again, it was the landscape that changed so dramatically that we needed to think about, are those conventional wisdoms still working? And, and let me just say, some of them do. It's not about throwing them out completely, but it is about knowing when to replace them with something new and almost, not almost, but something counterintuitive. So what, what are those uh, landscape changes that you've seen that have led to some of the old practices not being, you know, relevant or e even practical anymore? Well, I mean, I think you cannot pick up an article that doesn't start with the same, you know, it's become almost trite, right? Mm -hmm. um, digitally connected, always on, do more, push harder, globally competitive, you know, it is a constant push. And I think I see leaders that are overwhelmed and they're plagued mm -hmm. by this, you know, uh, perfect storm of all of these things coming together, right? They're, they're drowning in data. They're drinking from the fire hose. Mm -hmm. They don't know how to separate the wheat from the chaff. And it's just becoming overwhelming. And that is the kind of landscape I'm talking about. Yeah, and I think uh, one of the things that, uh, you know, I've been talking to people a lot recently about is, I mean, you're right, I mean, you know, digitally connected, but humanly disconnected. Um, we're overwhelmed with information. We feel like we're the busiest people the world has ever seen. But I would also argue we're the most distracted people the world has yeah. ever seen because yeah. we have we can distract ourselves in in so many different ways now during the course of a day we have access to everything we could possibly want to access and so um, so how do you then help people to to figure out where they should really be focusing and how they cut out all of this extraneous noise right so what I propose to them sounds very counterintuitive. And that's the whole point of the book, right? Yeah. So there are these practices um, that they're gonna make them uncomfortable when I make the suggestion, right? But 
if I ask them, you know, look at what you're doing now and, and, and how are you trying to manage this landscape now? They all say the same thing. They're just trying to keep up or they're doing more, right? They're, they're trying to figure out how to save more time. Uh, they're looking at time management programs or organizational programs. And I'm saying to them, it is about doing things like willing to sit still while everybody else is in motion, right? So that's the first chapter, for example, of my book. It's about our bias for action and how we've been conditioned to always move forward or to do something. Mm -hmm. And I'm proposing that in order to keep up with the pace, they actually take a strategic pause, either during the day, during the week, they make an unbreakable appointment with themselves. Yeah, that's a, that's a, that's a really interesting point because, as you say, it's it's counterintuitive not just to business, but it's counterintuitive to life uh, oh. today. Right, is where everything is instant. Everything is every second of every of every day is filled with something, and usually multiple things. Right. Right. So how do you how do you get people to understand the power of taking that that time out? Well, again, in my book, I did a lot of research around this concept because I, what I didn't want is for people to think that I was going to propose that they meditate, for example. Um, and I'm all about mindfulness. Mm -hmm. I think it's a good practice, but that's not what I'm talking about here. Um, and so I, I included research about how the brain works and that we are actually doing a lot when we're doing nothing. Mm -hmm. In other words, we are taking in so much information in meetings, in what we're reviewing in terms of reports, big data. But when we give ourselves that strategic pause, we're able to marinate that data, to percolate on it, and start to make connections where there may not have been connections before. And that is absolutely where innovation happens, right? Mm -hmm. We are able to, uh, as I said before, figure out what part of that data is worth keeping and what part we need to get rid of. We are able to think of things like, what is, what is the data not telling me? What have I not considered as part of this data? So again, I like to give people the business case for taking the strategic pause, because I think most leaders need that, right? It's yeah. not on a whim. I'm not just saying, you know, it's good for you. Uh, there's another study in there about, you know, a study that was done on soccer professionals. Mm -hmm. And this is becoming a pretty popular study, but one that shows when it comes to these penalty kicks that goalies are better off uh, in terms of stopping these penalty uh, goals from coming in if they remain front and center. But the percentage of goalies that do that is actually, even knowing this, is actually very low. They move to the right or to the left. Because as you said, as a society, we cannot wrap our arms around the idea that sitting still is productive. Yeah. Right? Now, it's funny. I mean, being a, being a big soccer slash football fan. <laughs> uh, yeah, there's still, a lot of, there's still a lot of penalty scored by the... Uh, by um, the penalty taker by just knocking the ball straight down the middle because it does take it does take guts for the goalie to stand still and to stay in the one place even knowing that that there is a likelihood that that might happen but yeah. it is it is fascinating though um, what you've happened upon here in the fact of how counterintuitive it counterintuitive intuitive it is right. to us today um just in terms of of all the the rush that's around us and and one of the interesting things i see in 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 your chapters here one of them is like uh ditch the need to let hard data drive every decision and again that's not what we've been fed. In fact, we're constantly fed that more data, the more data is better, and there's more ways of extracting that data, and you should be 150% data-driven. Right, right, and you know, data these days is very sexy, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, it's, it is the latest, greatest thing, and don't get me wrong, I think data is very sound, it is less subjective, but I think what happens is, we risk ignoring 
what I call soft intelligence, if mm -hmm. we over rely on big data or hard data. And soft intelligence to me is the why behind the data. So if we're looking at customer uh, feedback or customer stats, then we run the risk of understanding why they ranked us the way they did, right? Because we're talking about numbers. Mm -hmm. We don't get to hear the why behind how they ranked us or the why behind why they're using a product a certain way. Uh, we, we don't necessarily get out behind our desk and go watch our customers use our products and services in their natural habitat. So we miss out on what I call the soft intelligence if we over rely on hard data. So again, reporting more of a balance, it's not an either or, but there are certain times where I think we need to move beyond the data. Yeah, no, I, I, I would agree. I think that, uh, that an over-reliance on data, you do miss out on uh, the nuances, right? And, and then the nuances are often where the, the real insights come from. Exactly. Yeah. And um, and I know it's interesting, you know, because uh, you know I talk to a lot of experts, and that um, the, the break free, breaking free from the expert trap. That's a that's another interesting title that jumped out at me there. Yes, and you know, I, again, I think leaders, many of them start out uh, or are where they are because they were subject matter experts, mm -hmm. right? And they were relied on that they were rewarded for that uh it's something they're proud of and no doubt i think a leader's job is to then transfer their knowledge but in order to do that i think you have to be as good at asking the right question mm -hmm. as you are at having the right answer yeah and so that's that's one place to start in terms of developing your team if you have the answers you're not sharing the knowledge, you're not developing your, your folks to understand how to get there on their own. Mm -hmm. But the other, I think, really impactful part of this is if they are willing to resign their position as an expert, then I think we get at the innovation part because then they're willing to see things with fresh eyes. Right. Right. And, and that's, the other part of that chapter that I think is so critical. Yeah, and I think it's a really interesting from, from a leadership point of view, you're, you're 100%, uh, you're correct. I think one of the most powerful things you can do as, as a leader, and this is something that I learned, um, you know, in the, in the course of my career in leading organizations was that moment when somebody, you know, maybe you're sitting with your executive team or whatever, and somebody asks you a question and you just go, I don't know. I don't know the answer to that. Does anybody know the, you know, does anybody have an idea on that? Because then you give permit, you know, then you sort of say, yes, I don't know everything. And that's the reason why I have all of you here is because I don't know everything. Right. Right. Absolutely. And I, and again, I think we're conditioned to believe that that is a career limiting move or that it diminishes our credibility. And I I would venture to say that in this day and age, again, because the landscape is so different, yeah. we cannot possibly keep up with and be the subject matter expert, the both functional and general leader at the same time. We've got to let some of that go. Yeah, I know. I agree completely because there is, um, there's such, things have gotten so complicated that there's a need for specialization in a lot of areas and you can't possibly be an expert in everything. It, it, it makes no sense, uh, makes no sense at all. Um, so when you, when you have worked with um, leaders and you've worked through your program with them and, and the, the contents in your book, what, what changes have you seen and, and what impact does that have on an organization when a leader you know, is unchained rather than unhinged? Because that's a completely different yeah. <laughs> I see that plenty, yes. Um, well, so, you know, first and foremost, the book published last week. Mm -hmm. So it's a, it's a new book. I have incorporated the ideas with some work with leaders, especially if I'm doing some coaching with a cohort or a high potential group. Mm -hmm. It makes for fabulous discussion on, let's try on a different way to approach your work. And it's about 
dipping their toe in the water and trying on one or two of the things from the book, the concepts, the practices, mm -hmm. and then reporting back as to how, how it's served them or in some cases how it's been hard to do in their company culture. So let's mm -hmm. face it. I mean, some of these are counterintuitive as an individual and they're counterintuitive for a culture. Mm -hmm. And so it's, it can, it can look like fits and starts for some others have seen tremendous impact, not just on their work, but it, it's reconnecting them to why they're a leader. Right. You know, that's what I hear a lot of times is that leaders feel like they're walking to do lists and that they've lost the meaning behind their role and, and they just are trying to keep up. And so these practices are to help them both manage their work, but also reconnect to meaningful work as a leader. And those are the two things that I've seen happen. The other thing we talk about and that I've noticed is that there's no doubt that what the expectation is for a leader is that they need to both do more and think more. Mm -hmm. And those two things run counter. And so these practices I'm hearing leaders tell me is allowing them to think more, not just do more. Yeah, and I think again, you've 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 touched on something a very fundamental point here. And I do think if you if you talk to most leaders today, because we always have that, yeah, you know, we'd always have that conversation about the difference between leadership and management. You know, and yet I think leadership today has become just management on steroids in a lot of ways because you're correct because there's so many things to deliver so um so the idea of reconnecting with what what the purpose of leadership is and what your purpose as a leader is i i think that's a that's a critical thing that people should definitely look at because otherwise we are just maybe we're just kind of very good managers of lots of things and we're not really ever taking the time out to be proper leaders. Well, and, and not the company loses out, but the individual loses out mm -hmm. because again, they, they're disconnected from the larger purpose of their role. Uh, and that, and that's not just to develop their followers, but they want to grow even where they are right um so going back to the resigning your position as expert i think the, the third and probably most important factor in that chapter is that i think it's incumbent upon leaders to disrupt their own thinking mm -hmm. you know yeah. you reach a level as a leader especially as a senior leader where it's like the bl black belt uh, analogy People think the black belt is the epitome of success in that particular genre, but what they don't know is that really a black belt signifies you've not reached the ultimate, you are now ready to transform and learn from a new perspective. Yeah. And, and that's, that's what well, I think. Yeah, being a being a um, a martial artist myself, I've ah. been doing martial arts for a long, long, long time. But you're you're absolutely one hundred percent correct. Is people often think that your journey to a black belt that's the journey. You know, you get through your color belts and you get your black belt. Um, the reality is, the black belt is your is your beginning as a student. You've earned the right to be a student, and I think that's to your point. I think that's a great analogy because I think that's your point when you get into a leadership position, it's like you've earned your right to be a student of leadership. That's correct. Well, this has been great. We're bumping up against the end of our time. It's been a fascinating conversation. Um, and so before we go, Sarah, I'd like to make sure that you tell people a little bit more about yourself, about how they can contact you. And as we said, the book has just been released. It's on, it's on Amazon, Leadership Unchanged, Defy Conventional Wisdom for Breakthrough Performance. So if you want to tell people a little bit more about yourself and how they can find out more. Certainly. So uh, you can reach me on my website, uh, sarahcanaday.com, and that's Sarah, no H, and Canada, just like Canada, but with the Y at the end. Also happy to connect uh, with your followers and your listeners on LinkedIn. Uh, I do have a, about a dozen or more courses on LinkedIn learning that are leadership-based if they have interest in 
uh, learning more about some of my leadership uh, practices and principles. And, uh, you know, happy to connect on Twitter, Facebook, um, and, you know, uh, be, be of service as a speaker or, uh, you know, consultant uh, for their leadership programs. Excellent. But again, my name is John Golden, Sales Pop Online, Sales Magazine, Pipeliner, CRM. This is another Expert Insight interview. I'll see you all for another one soon. Thank you. Thank you for having me.